citizens locked down in their homes in pursuit of zero Covid. Plus, we'll talk about a national shortage of hormone replacement therapy drugs affecting thousands of women and leaving many with no option but to travel overseas in search of alternative supplies. Former Royal Marine Monty Halls will be with us to talk about his new book, Commando, accompanying a new TV series detailing the daring do and extraordinary history of the legendary elite fighting force. And if all that wasn't thrilling enough, we'll celebrate the birthday of Rosie, the world's oldest humble penguin. Don't waddle off. But first, here's the news with Tamsin Roberts. Neil, thank you. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. The MP accused of watching pornography in the Commons has announced that he will resign. Neil Parrish admitted looking at adult material on two occasions, once deliberately. A spokesperson for his local Conservative Association thanked the MP for his service and said they supported his decision. Speaking to the BBC, Mr Parrish said it was a moment of madness and that he was not proud of his actions. The uh, situation was that, that um, I, uh, funnily enough, it was tractors that I was looking at. And um, so I did get into another website um, that had a sort of very similar name. Um, and I watched it for a bit, which I shouldn't have done. But my, my crime, my biggest crime, um, is that on another occasion I went in a second time. And that was deliberately and That was deliberate. Um, and was that in the Select Committee or in the Commons Chamber? That was uh, sitting, waking, waiting to vote. Former Conservative adviser Claire Pearsall told GB News she's not surprised Mr Parrish has resigned. He will be uh, hounded by the media. He will also be hounded by his residents, quite rightly, who want an answer. But also, if he came back to the House of Commons when we return uh, in a couple of weeks' time, I suspect that all questions will be directed to him about this behaviour. So I can understand why he's done it, but I'm disappointed because it means now that there is no investigation and I do worry that no action will ever get taken to change the uh, atmosphere that we have. Ukraine's defence ministry says Russia is increasing the intensity of their offensive in the east of the country. They claim that residents in the region of Kharkiv and neighbouring areas were being forcibly taken to Russia by Moscow's forces. The city of Mariupol is also still under siege, with Russian troops focusing on the steelworks, where hundreds of troops and civilians are stranded. Residents of the southern port city have spoken of the total devastation of their homes. It was my home, or what's left of it after the shellings. Everything burned, so now I have become homeless. I have nowhere to go. Now I live in my friend's place. He sheltered me for some time. Everything is gone. All that's left is the toilet, door and hallway. Nothing more. Tell me, was it a necessity to bomb civilians with such bombs? You have to be a fanatic to do it. No shame, no conscience, no feeling of proportion, nothing. They made the whole block homeless in old age. Police in Ukraine say they found a mass grave containing the bodies of men who were apparently bound, gagged and tortured. It's after the US accused the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, of brutality and depravity in his two-month invasion of the country. Kiev says more than a 1,000 bodies have been discovered in around the town of Bucha, so far where it's alleged Russia has committed numerous war crimes. Moscow rejects the allegation and the brother of Kiev's mayor, Vladimir Klitschko, says he's seen evidence of Russian war crimes crimes in his country. Tortured, executed bodies of civilians with their hands tied behind their back on their knee and executed with the headshots. I've seen it with my own eyes many, many hundreds of dead civilians. It's just horrifying. The government is investigating reports an injured British man is being held captive by Russia. It's after an unverified video emerged reportedly showing Andrew Hill being interrogated by Russian forces after being captured in Ukraine. The Foreign Office is urgently seeking more information and is supporting his family members. Police searching for a woman who went missing a week ago in Lancashire say they found a body. Katie Kenyon was last seen getting into a Ford Transit van in Burnley eight days ago. Officers say formal identification is yet to take place, but the family of the 33-year-old mother of two have been informed of the discovery. 
TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Neil Oliver Live. We need some grown-ups in the room and pronto. As things stand in this country, right this moment, we're being governed by what appear to be outsize school children, intent only on picking fights with one another in the playground, calling each other names. As far as anyone can tell, the party of government and those of the opposition are interested only in themselves and each other. Life in a goldfish bowl has apparently given them five minute memory spans Round and round they swim, seeing nothing beyond the glass and having the same tiny fights with their fellow inmates again and again and again. It's narcissistic nonsense from a political class that demonstrably feels entitled to treat us proles with out and out contempt while they set about the petty business of personal point scoring. This internecine squabbling is apparently supposed to keep us happy, thrilled by their clever verbal sparring, as if. More than anything else, the carryings on of Johnson, Starmer, Rayner, et al. Take me all the way back to my own days at school, watching the members of the various self-important cliques sniping at one another in hopes of being briefly seen to have come out on top. Partygate, Cakegate, Beergate, Raynergate, Porngate. It's one childish tantrum spat after another. And we're supposed to care who's winning. Events on the green benches of the Commons this week just past have been like an episode of 80s comprehensive school drama Grange Hill. Zamo got caught in class with a copy of Razzle magazine stuffed down his trousers. Trisha Yates was in bother again on account of her skirt not being deemed appropriate for school. And serial clown Tucker Jenkins was, as per usual, caught up in one hilarious scrape after another. How we didn't laugh. If their antics aren't from the school playground, then it might as well be carry on up the dispatch box. It's nothing more or less than embarrassing. And to a great extent, the joke really is on us because we give these characters our votes. Of course, none of it's really funny at all. It's pathetic when you get right down to it. And we're paying for this skit show. Sometimes you have to wonder if what we're seeing, what we're being treated to as some sort of amateur dramatics slapstick comedy isn't deliberate distraction. Feeding us full of popcorn at the circus is hardly an original tactic from MPs who need the peasants to look the other way. History is awash with times when the rulers of this state or that found themselves so out of their depth they had to fall back on the time honoured trick of giving the plebs something else to look at while the fires burned out of control elsewhere. This country, this world in fact, is a damned mess now, teetering on the brink of chaos. Here at home, our elected representatives have pushed us with the cattle prods of their emergency laws into a swamp of financial ruin. Two years ago they locked us down, deliberately and knowingly bringing the juggernaut of the economy to a stuttering, juddering halt. They sprayed trillions of pounds of fake money, money they didn't and never will have in every direction, including straight into the pockets of chums and also right down the drain. Desperate voices cried out that lockdown was madness, guaranteed to cause every kind of harm, but those voices were silenced and our leaders carried right on ignoring their own rules while force marching the population along a trail of tears to where we are now. Trust me when I say, I know I sound like a broken record on all this, ceaselessly banging away week after week about the same old stuff, but the fact remains no one is being held to account for any of it, far from it. With every day that passes, it seems like more and more people are just too worn down to care anymore. Those decision makers who ignored warnings and calls like the Great Barrington Declaration for other, better ways of handling the situation plainly think they're off the hook. A court ruled last week that the decision to send elderly patients from hospital to care homes was unlawful, and yet all former Health Secretary Matt Hancock seems intent on doing in the aftermath is pushing his self-serving memoirs to anyone who'll listen. Without so much as an acknowledgement of error or wrongdoing, far less any sort of apology for stubborn disregard of warnings of hellish consequences for millions of silenced, essentially invisible people, those responsible have moved on, leaving the broken unheeded in their wake. And we're letting them away with it for no better reason but that we're tired of it all and have been handed by the same people even more to worry about instead. No one is more tired of thinking about this stuff, hearing this stuff and talking about this stuff than I am. But if they think after two years that I'll just call it quits and meekly watch the rubble swept under the carpet, they can think again. For as long as I live, I will not forget, far less forgive, this disaster of our leaders' making. 
There's certainly a palpable desperation to see us all move on, though. Don't bother about that, they say, that's old news. Bother about this, look at her legs. Check out the porn site on the screen of his mobile phone. Miss, miss, he ate a cake, and him over there, he drank a bottle of beer. All of it shows they felt they had nothing to fear, and just went ahead and did as they saw fit while telling us something entirely different. You know they call England the mother of parliaments. This shaming debacle, this parcel of rogues hissing and spitting at each other like cats in a sack. This is the bunch we're supposed to trust to navigate the great ship of state through the storm ahead, and without a doubt there's a storm coming. They're calling it a cost of living crisis, of course, but it sounds more like financial ruin to me. Spiking, spiralling prices for anything and everything, rising inflation, rising interest rates, disrupted supply chains, dependence on other people's energy, shortages of this, that and the other. Let's not forget either the mental and physical health tsunami for young and old alike. The NHS that was the focus of all efforts, the church that was to be saved at any cost, can't meet the needs of untold members of the sick and the dying. Every day more questions are asked about the safety and efficacy of the vaccines, and with good reason, and yet still they push their concoctions, boosters, jabs for children and babies. Lockdowns compromised young immune systems, impacted early development, robbed many of their educations, and yet no one is brought to account for any of it. Before long they'll have the temerity to say we all made our own choices, personal responsibility and all that. Now there's war in Europe. Talk of nuclear weapons being brought to bear for the first time since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. An energy crisis caused not by war but by the madness of net zero and the lack of reliable domestic energy supply might soon see the lights going out all over that continent. Would-be authoritarians are scuttling around laying the foundations of digital IDs and social credit systems that might create a world of human bondage. Allied with programmable digital currencies controlled by central banks, we might be en route for lives in which privacy, let alone personal freedom, are consigned to the dustbin of history. No matter where you look, there's trouble and strife and more on the way. And what are our lot up to? What are our elected representatives focusing all their attention upon and thereby trying to focus our attentions to? A months old he said, she said, still rumbling on, Yet more rank hypocrisy from Sir Beer Starmer, who turns out to have downed a few indoors with chums while simultaneously berating the PM for not placing harsh enough restrictions on the lives and loves of the electorate. Infantile, degrading nonsense about the crossing and uncrossing of a woman's legs, did she or didn't she, and whether or not the PM was distracted by the scissoring. Time out for a taxpayer-funded perusal of porn on the green benches of the Commons. The world is in flux as never before in our lifetimes, Pestilence, war, famine and death, the gang's all here, and back in Westminster it's cake and skirts and internet porn. Someone's fiddling right enough, and coming from somewhere not far away, there's a smell of smoke. All of that is my opinion, of course, and you're free to disagree. Keep your tweets and emails coming all through the show. You can email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews and I'll try to get to as many as possible of your comments as the show progresses. Tonight, joining me for the next two hours are Daniel Moylan, who's a former advisor to Boris Johnson and Conservative Life Peer, and Jacob Reynolds, who's Partnerships Manager at the Academy of Ideas. Welcome to you both. Thank you very much, Neil. Good to see you. Uh, Jacob... Uh, Do we deserve more serious people at such a serious time? Yeah, I, I definitely think we deserve uh, better representatives. And your, your your monologue just there kind of really hit the nail on the head in terms of the lack of seriousness that pervades our political class, especially when there's such kind of serious international and domestic issues at play. Nonetheless, though, I do... I, I, the, I would like to just slightly challenge maybe some of the spirit of what you said, if not the detail, in terms of... There is a danger that we can view ourselves as constantly being done to, as there being those elected representatives who have locked us down, which they have, but they're always the ones doing things to us. And so I'd just like to ask the question of how we can reframe things slightly to think about what we can do and how we can push back and the actions that we can all take in both at the ballot box, but also in wider democracy and the arguments that we have with each other to make a kind of more positive atmosphere sometimes. What would some of those steps be? I, I hear you and I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, just going through proactive. London today and seeing some of the, the continuing kind of anti-lockdown or anti-vaccine protests that are going on, I think there's a danger among some people if you view yourself as kind of a victim, as constantly being done to, then you retreat into your own 
little bubble and maybe you only speak to people who have kind of similar views to you. And it really is incumbent on us to constantly make the effort to go out, challenge each other, speak to people we disagree with and not necessarily view ourselves as being done to in our own little box, notwithstanding all of the massive challenges you identified. Da Daniel, when all we have is the vote, essentially, uh, it is, is it not, discouraging when we see the people who are supposed to be those that we can choose to vote for or not uh, indulging in this kind of frippery, well, this kind, in, of, in this kind of silliness. In a democracy, you get a mix of people elected to represent you, and that's only right and natural. If you want to be governed by sort of hugely capable technocrats, the sort of people who gave us the lockdowns, then don't bother with democracy and just appoint them. So you're, you're bound to get a mix of people when you, when you have a democratic system. The government has been trying to focus on um, some really important things, like, I think, the war in Ukraine, which it's been trying to focus on. There are other things. Um, it hasn't yet sorted out properly how it's going to handle the cost of living crisis, as people call it, that's coming our way, which is an inflationary bubble partly caused by the vast amount of money we've been printing over the years. Wouldn't there, couldn't there be a moving on? Uh, you know, Daniel's suggesting, uh, Jacob is, is suggesting that there's a need to be proactive in that regard. And wouldn't that be helped if some of those who made those decisions, or indeed on the opposition side, called for even tighter, longer, harsher restrictions, would admit some mistakes, would admit that the judgments that were made were the wrong ones? That would be a, a clearing of the air rather yeah. than just distracting if, us with the next trauma. Yeah, the real question about that, looking back, is were they the wrong judgments at the time? Did you know they were the wrong judgments at the time, or have you learnt later that there were better things you could have done? My personal view is that um, there was a case for the government to impose lockdowns at the time, what we saw coming out of Italy, the strong advice they were getting, the howling for lockdowns from the press and opposition parties, more, longer, harder. But I don't think it turned out to be the right thing to do. I think it would really clear the air, looking forward like Jacob, to what happens in the future, the important thing. If the government were now to say, we're scrapping all the legislation on which lockdowns were based, while we're in power at least, there will never ever be a lockdown again. We're not preparing, as the chief scientific or chief medical officer, I think, said the other day, we've got to think how to handle future lockdown. No, the way to handle future lockdowns is we're never, ever going to have them. And if, there's, if there are infectious diseases about um, people of, that affect the whole country, then people make their own decisions. But Boris Johnson has, is on record saying he hasn't ruled out lockdowns. You're saying yeah, confidently that I think that he should rule be. it out. I think the government should rule it out. No, you can't rule it out for future governments. That's the way our system works. You can't say, you know, 20, 30 years down the road when there's a different government. But I don't think that's what he meant when he said he wasn't. He was saying that everything was still on the table. And he yeah, seemed that's to, right. seemed well, to I think play he for himself. Rule it out. I think he should rule it out. That's what I'm saying. I think and Boris Johnson would say, we rule it out. While I'm Prime Minister, while this government is in power, if something like this happens again, we will not go in for lockdowns enforced by law. If people want to withdraw and look after themselves because they're vulnerable, that's their business. Um, uh, and a private judgment can be exercised. But we are not enforcing any more lockdowns ever again. The damage it did was very considerable. Probably, it's hard to know, probably greater than the, the benefits that flowed from it. But the costs was just so severe that we never do it again. It, it, Jacob, is, 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 there any, is there any credibility in the government's uh, persistence with the idea that they were responding to a, a national health emergency? Well, I mean, maybe less than the responding to the scientific advice. What we need to examine and think about is that they were responding as well to significant public demand. Yeah. And that we ourselves have to recognise that in society there's a real battle to be won for the kinds of freedoms that maybe we took for granted before the, before the lockdowns. And the, the thing I also wanted to say is that just the, the, the danger in kind of focusing on the old lockdowns to do with COVID and infectious diseases is that you can see people in power thinking about lockdowns for other kinds of issues, for climate lockdowns or for the, or, or using those kind of same personal powers to uh, battle obesity or whatever it is. And we need to obviously really get wise about what might be coming. And to, and to move on a bit, why do you think they, they indulge in the kinds of juvenile displays of the sort that are going on just now. I mean, this nonsense around Angela Rayner and, you know, whether she did or didn't cross her legs to distract Boris Johnson. You know, the revelation of, of, a, of an MP, a serving MP, apparently downloading porn on his on his phone. The, this, the, the, the back and forth about, you know, who went to which party, who had cake. 
can't they, can't they get a sense that the people facing cost of living crises, spiking costs for, for everything around them, real threats to their way of life, and the people supposedly in command of the ship of state are arguing about skirts and cake. Mm. Well, this is not an original point to note that the, one of the big problems we face in this country and in other similar countries is that politics, politics and politicians have become a professional class. And so what goes on in their own little chambers and amongst their own friends is of far more interest to them than kind of these wider issues. And it's, it, it's, it's up to us, really, to demand that they I get I think there's a bit serious. more to it than that. I think the, the fact is, first of all, the government would be delighted if people stopped talking about cakes and the whole thing went away, and they, I don't think they want to talk about Angela Rayner's legs. They certainly don't want to talk about porn in the chamber. Um, Neil Parrish is leaving, so perhaps we'll stop talking about porn in the chamber, chamber quite quickly. So the government doesn't want to talk about any of those things. But the opposition wants to win the next election. And one of the ways in which you uh, win an election is by competing on policies. That seems to be a thing of the past nowadays. And another way is by focusing on what, what used to be called character. You know, can you trust this person? And so trying to make out that Boris is an untrustworthy liar and keeping on going on all of that is, is an attempt by them to win the next general election. I'd rather they were debating policies and people were saying why you should vote for us because this policy isn't working and we'd have a better policy and so on. But, but it's degenerated into a discussion but about I ask character. Again, but it's a it... fair point. It's not entirely unfair... If you're in an electoral contest, to talk about the character of the leaders, leader and leaders of the opposition, of the party opposite you. But people are angry. I understand the, why the, they do it. The general electorate out there are angry. There's a palpable sense of it. And I, I say again, yeah, wouldn't, there be some, wouldn't there be some justice? Wouldn't there be some clearing of the air? If some of the people who made the decisions that have been proven to be bad decisions would simply acknowledge as much, rather than simply trying to move on straight away to the next problem, without you know you've got to acknowledge the mistakes of the past. And I, I ask again, wouldn't that be the the thing to do that would ease some of the yeah, take Neil, some of the heat Neil, out of the, the situation? Is, although I understand you've got very strong views, and I have some sympathy with some of the things you've said, but. The fact is there isn't agreement about what was a mistake in the past. There isn't an agreement about it. There are still people who would say, I'm sure all the scientists who urge lockdown would come out and they'd say on your show now, it was the right thing to do and it saved lives. And that was the thing. And it also That's protected the national no longer, health service. That is no longer a defensible position that it saved lives. It has cost more lives, surely, in the, in the medium and longer term than, it, the, than those lockdowns could... I ever have some sympathy with your view, but my point is there are a lot of people who said at the time, this is what you need to do to save lives. And the contrary people. voices were shouted down. There were... That was absolutely true, just as they're shouted down on climate change and other things. And it re it's something very revealing about the scientific community, I think, that where you expect a disinterested and open debate about propositions on some of the key issues of our day the scientific community has an immensely closed mind. And when they're challenged by their own other scientists, they tend to denigrate them and rubbish them. And I find this um, a really dispiriting thing about science in general that we need to look at. But there is still the case, you know, it isn't absolutely clear that every... I might have some sympathy with what you're saying, but it's not an agreed position. It was an all a failure. Um, and, and, you know, there's going to be this public inquiry and this will go on for years, but at some point, It'll be possible to make that sort of judgment, possibly. But I don't think that you can do that now and expect everyone to agree. And remember, the, as Jacob said, the country was demanding lockdown and they wanted all of this and they wanted it better enforced. And my view is, and I said this at the time, when I wasn't in the House of Lords when the lockdown started, but I went in later. And we, we had these statutory instruments that changed the regulations for every couple of months, a new regulation, do this, do, rule of six, or don't do that, whatever it was, new things coming in, going out. And I said in the House of Lords twice, I said, this is not, this is not fit matter for legislation. Nobody's reading these laws. Even the police aren't reading these laws. As we know, what people are reading is slogans, rule of six, or don't do that, bite-sized chunk slogans. And people thought those slogans were the law. No, they weren't. The law was an incomprehensible mess of rules that nobody was Dis following at all. I think dispiriting is the word. I think dispiriting in the part of the elected legislation. representatives and dispiriting in the part of the close-mindedness of some scientists, without a doubt.
After the break, we'll be meeting the woman who spent time in one of the so-called COVID quarantine camps in China. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Alarming images of vast COVID quarantine camps in China are circulating on social media and even some mainstream media. In pursuit of zero COVID, the Chinese Communist Party has for weeks now locked down Shanghai's population of 25 million people, shutting them in their homes and not allowing anyone outside, not even for food or to walk their dogs. The same tactic has spread to Beijing and there are reports of as many as 45 Chinese cities under the same restrictions, with over 140 million people locked down perhaps. Anyone testing positive for COVID as the CCP fights the Omicron variant faces compulsory detention in huge camps hastily constructed for the purpose. Ukrainian national Jane Polobotko a marketing manager for a Chinese music technology company living in Shanghai for the last nine years, recently had to spend 18 days in one of the camps. Uh, Jane joins me now back in her home in Shanghai, I think, uh, where she remains locked down like the rest of the population. Good evening, Jane. Hello. Thank you for, thank you for joining us. Uh, so what happened to you? You were going about your life one day as normal and, and then what happened? Uh, well, unfortunately, yeah, I was tested positive on March 28th and um, I had no symptoms or I had like very mild one on the first day um, of when I was tested positive. But um, yeah, when I was when I got to the COVID center, um, I, when I was brought there, I was feeling pretty much OK. And um, I spent there almost 19 days. Um, and after that, I was transferred back home to my flat here in Shanghai um, and I'm in a lockdown right now. What was the camp or the centre, the COVID centre, what was it like and what did you experience during your nearly 19 days? Well, the one that I've been to, um, it's a Shanghai Expo Centre, uh, which is normally used as a trade show building. Um, it was a big hall with like 4,000 people inside, 4,000 beds, like basically one person um, all had one bed for, for him or herself. Um, it was, um, I mean, the facilities were not, uh, were not very nice, I would say. Uh, we had no showers or um, there were lights all the time, 24 seven, which seems to be a common uh, thing for all the quarantine centers for some reason. Um, 
And I mean, we had food <laughs> three times a day, which which was fine. Uh, but in general, those conditions, uh, I don't think were really helpful to be treated, you know, to, to feel better from COVID. What was the atmosphere like among the de the detainees? What were people saying? What was the what was the the mood? Right. Um, I, I would say that the first week, or maybe even the first ten days, it was kind of all right. People were holding up, and uh, like we knew that we would have to spend there some time. But after, yeah, I would say like after day ten, uh, people started getting really frustrated and anxious because nobody could tell us how long we would have to stay there or what it takes to get out of there. So there were like a lot of arguings and shoutings, the, um, uh, like people who were in there and med staff with the nurses, you know, asking how we can get out, when. Um, so it was like this anxiety, it was a collective anxiety was building up more and more and more day by day. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I think that was also um, influencing a bit uh, the ment our mental sta state, the well-being in there, uh, which wasn't like definitely positive or good. And how were you finally able to get out and get back home? Um, so ultimately, I think it was on April 8th uh, when the government said that you need only two uh, negative tests in a row. Uh, there should be at least 24 hours in between each other. The test should be done um, at least 24 hours in between. And so um, I actually already by that time had two tests, but then they had to test us again, so I had three tests, and finally, that would um, allow, like, that would allow me to be qualified to leave and to uh, get home. So basically, there's like an ambulance that brings everyone back home to their to their district. Um, there's no way for us, like, to you know get a subway or 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 taxi. There is no public transport working right now in Shanghai, so we would have to wait for the uh, for the logistics for the ambulance to bring us back home. It's on such a scale, and it's obviously it's hard for us uh, in the West to tell because, of course, the, the CCP are so careful about the, what images they, they, they allow to leave China. Are there, is there speculation or suspicion that, that this lockdown on such a scale is just about the Omicron variant of COVID, which, as far as most of the rest of the world is concerned, is, is mild? Um, well, it's um, it's hard for me to say because usually, like the kind of those kind of political information on within China is quite difficult also to get here. So I would I would you know read all the Western news or media outlets to figure out what's exactly happening. My personal point of view is that maybe this is the way China is showing to the world that the way they um, they cope with the COVID is way better, and this is the only right way. Um, kind of like, you know, um, showing that, like, against the how it's done in the West, which is in a completely different way. The, the, at least the lockdown is not as strict as we're having it in here um, in China. And obviously, no, no, the asymptomatic cases have to go to those kind of the COVID centers. So, but this is just, just my view. It's definitely, you, you can see a huge difference between how it's done in the West and in China and uh just feels like China is trying to say that this is how we want to do it and this is the only right way. Jane, Jane bear with me and stay with me while I talk to uh, the, the guests sure. that I have in the, in the studio with me. Jacob, it's bizarre to, to look on at what's happening, the, the spread of lockdown hmm. to, you know, into the hundreds of millions of people. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, before we had lockdowns here and people were seeing the pictures out of Wuhan and elsewhere in China, there was a sense, I think, in the UK and in the West that, OK, China's got lots of institutional capacity, they're building hospitals at a really quick rate, and that they've kind of got the answers on how to deal with COVID. And then obviously people followed them and, and that went on. This time around, it feels different without, I mean, Jay maybe alluded to it slightly there, but it feels like there's slightly more a sense of kind of obstinacy or in even cases panic in China about what's going on and that the solution that they had before, it doesn't just seem like doing the same thing over and over again is really working there. We can, of course, debate the merits of lockdowns, whatever, but politically, it just feels like this is a very different kind of response and puts China on the world stage in a different light than it did way back at the beginning of the lockdowns. Daniel, how would you interpret those, those images are quite, are quite something, wouldn't you say, to, to imagine so many people 
it under such draconian control? Well, it's, it's terrifying. Up until a few hundred years ago, there used to be regular visitations in Europe of bubonic plague. And the techniques that were used, I mean, they were quite well-refined techniques towards the end. The techniques that were used for managing bubonic plague were exactly the same as what has been going on now. You had lockdowns in urban areas, people locked up in their homes, sometimes actually nailed up in their homes. You had uh, quarantine centres called lazaretti that were thrown up very quickly, just like Nightingale hospitals, whatever, thrown up quickly so that the infected people could be moved out there. Face masks, ban on public processions, closure of non-essential shops and businesses. All of this was going on in the 17th century. Didn't work then. But we're going back at it thinking it's all going to work again now as a sort of long-term... As a temporary measure, that's bad enough. But as a long-term measure aimed at eliminating a virus which is just going to spread, this is not going to work. So you have to ask yourself... I mean, Jane says it might be because the Chinese government wants to demonstrate to the rest of the world that they have a better way, but it's not going to work. It's not going to demonstrate a better way. In the meantime, the economy is tanking. People are genuinely suffering. And from the stories one hears, uh, there are potential, you know, outbreaks of dissatisfaction. I'm not saying rioting, but outbreaks of dissatisfaction, public dissatisfaction, uh, which threaten public order. And yet the whole thing isn't going to work. Um, so I think um, uh, the, the behaviour of the Chinese government is only explicable on other premises. And, and, and it really is. It, it is a society which increasingly over the last 10 years is interested in techniques for social control. This is a huge social control experiment, and whether that's part of what they're thinking or not, yes. I don't know. Jane, uh, if, if you're still with me there, do you get a sense of the general public, you, you, if you were listening there to, to Daniel, you know, suggesting that it, it's, it, it's, quite, it's quite a bizarre spectacle for us to look on at the, the application of techniques which didn't work hundreds of years ago and, and now the, the CCP are, are trying them again. Are, are people in the wider community talking amongst themselves about what, what they think is going on? Right. Well, because um, I'm staying at home, like basically within my flat and I'm not allowed to leave the building. So I don't get a chance actually to talk to people here. And I feel that in where I live, people are OK. They're dealing with the situation pretty nice. But I have friends that are living in different districts or different compounds, buildings, and um, people definitely are not very satisfied. And they actually show their dissatisfaction with like every night around 7 or 8 p.m. They will go out to their balconies and they would take a pen and uh, you know something else and like would make those this kind of noise uh, they call it music festival uh, but this is kind of the way of how people showing dissatisfaction of staying um, on a lockdown for so long and uh, just like one thing to note is that lockdown in Shanghai means that you really cannot leave your building you cannot go to the shop to buy your groceries so you would have to either uh, order it online, which is still possible, but of course it's not that easy. Like you would have to pay more, you would have to wait longer. Um, and but there is also some help from the government. Every month, uh, every sorry, every week we receive vegetables or or rice or like it really depends. Um, each 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 week what kind of package you receive. Uh, so there is some food, and again, it really depends from where, where you stay, which community, which, which district, and so on. Is there a, is there a feeling, a, a sense that it will never end? Uh, we, we know, we've internalised here in the West that, for example, the Omicron variant is, like the, is, is as transmissible and, and potentially as mild as the common cold and, and as, as endemic. For the people in in China, if they're if they're having to wait until the, the Chinese Communist Party is content that COVID has been eliminated one hundred percent, is it dawning on people that they might be in their homes forever? Uh, to be honest, I, I also do not understand and have no explanation to that. Um, I completely agree that Omicron seems to be a quite a you know mild with symptoms and um, and in general like. We, it's it's not as as bad as the original COVID back in 2020. So I really don't see. I personally really don't see the point uh, bringing us to those quarantine centers. I think people would be way better just staying home and just like going through uh, through this. And then yeah, in terms of how infectious is that? How easy it is to spread? I also have no idea like how how they're going to be able to control it and and to stop it. 
And, and while, I, while I have you here, Jane, I, I mentioned at the top that you're Ukrainian. Uh, are you in touch with, with home? Are you, do you have family that you're hearing from in, in relation to what's going on there? Uh, yes, I'm from Zaporizhia, which is south of Ukraine, uh, quite close to the front line, but um, still under control of Ukraine, and I hope that it will stay um, in, in this way. Um, I'm on the, yeah, I'm talking to my parents pretty much every day, um, which I'm really happy about. Um, and yeah, I have a strong belief that uh, Ukraine will prevail sooner or later. Some point. And and f finally, uh, Jane, when, when all this is, is over, if it gets to a, a, a conclusion in, in Shanghai, will you remain in Shanghai, in China, or, or do you have plans to go elsewhere? Um, this situation definitely made me reconsider uh, the, my, my stay in China, although I've been planning to leave maybe next year or like in the near future, but uh, this whole situation definitely accelerated and pushed to um, push me to definitely leave earlier. Hopefully, uh, it's hard to say when this lockdown will be over and what will be the procedure to actually you know, board on the plane and, and how many tests you need, how many permissions you need, all those kind of things. But hopefully that will be sorted out, sorted out soon and um, yeah, planning to leave this year. Jane, thank you so much for joining us, making time for us, and it's uh, it's always illuminating to hear from from people who are actually experiencing these stories at first hand. Uh, wish all the very best of luck, and that you find freedom again thank sometime you. very soon. Thank you. After the break, uh, essential menopause medication for women has been rationed as the UK experiences a shortage of HRT therapies. More on that in a couple of minutes. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Many women are resorting to the black market in search of hormone replacement therapy drugs. Shortage of supply has left many women struggling to obtain the drugs they need to help with the symptoms of their menopause. Left with no other option, some are meeting up and sharing and swapping supplies. Others are rationing their own prescriptions and more and more are traveling abroad to countries where such drugs are available over the counter. The Royal College of GPs has warned that women obtaining and taking drugs other than those specifically prescribed to them or in different dosages uh, risk potentially serious side effects. Katie Taylor is a campaigner about this issue uh, and joins me now to, uh, to have a, a consideration of what women are going through. Katie, thank you for, for making the time. This is a, this is a, a huge story. 
Yeah. Is it not? This, it is. Not just the shortage, but but the, the, the plight of so many women in the face of menopause. It, it absolutely is. And actually, the shortages is, is in some ways the least of the problems. I mean, I set up the Latte Lounge, which was a Facebook group six years ago, because for four years I'd been struggling with a whole variety of symptoms which were misdiagnosed as everything from depression, anxiety, heart palpitations. Um, and I was getting nowhere and I eventually left my job. Um, it was only when my father, who's a retired breast cancer professor, said, I think this is your hormones, um, did I finally get the right diagnosis from a gynaecologist. Um, and it was a word called perimenopause. And this was a word I'd never heard of. And it basically means your hormone levels fluctuate, you know, sometimes sort of early 40s, even earlier sometimes. Um, and I think what's happened is that um, women have been campaigning. Um, I joined up with a, a fantastic lady called Diane Danzibrink, who set up the Make Menopause Matter uh, campaign. Um, and we took it to Westminster in 2018 to say, look, there's no mandatory menopause training at medical school. We're not taught about it in schools at all. And we need workplace policies in place as well to support women in the workplace. Why is it in the 21st century that there's still so much lack of awareness in the general population, lack of training for the GPs that, in general terms, most people rely upon for all of their health concerns. Yeah. Why is it still such a mystery when it, when it applies to at least 50% of the population? Well, I think some of it stems back to there was a, a Women's Health Initiative um, trial in 2002 and it linked hormone replacement therapy to breast cancer and it was actually a flawed trial. So you have this sort of whole generation of doctors who, who immediately took their patients off hormone replacement therapy and women were terrified so they stopped, immediately stopped taking it. So you've got all this sort of scaremongering going on um, and GPs are our gatekeepers to health. They're amazing. They do amazing jobs. They can't all be specialists in everything. But they only have a 10-minute appointment with a woman. And because there are so many different curriculums at so many different uh, individual medical schools that, you know, uh, um, it's all healthcare professionals are coming out of medical school with very little menopause training at all. Um, and menopause actually is one day and one year since your last period. But actually you've got this, you know, when your hormones start fluctuating from, you know, usually from about early 40s onwards, you get these horrendous symptoms, brain fog, you know, anxiety. Um, I didn't have hot flushes and I was still having periods, so it didn't enter my mind it was to do with menopause. Um, and we need to take this seriously. 14 million working days are lost. You know, um, there are one in six women now in employment, uh, sorry, one in six people in employment now are women over 50. And, you know, they're, they're leaving the workplace. But this, this shortage that we, that we kind of use as a hook, really, for this larger story, yeah. will that, do you think, maybe uh, turn a bit of a light on the fact, you know, just alert people to the subject full stop? Well, look, we have been, as I said, you know, Diane and I and lots of other amazing campaigners, we've been up and down to Westminster meeting all cross-party MPs. We've given evidence to the, uh, the Menopause APPG, the Women's Health Initiatives, uh, sorry, the Women's Health Strategy, who promised that they'd put menopause front and centre. And I think what's happened with the Davina McCall programme, and there's another one coming out on Monday night, so that suddenly everyone is having this light bulb moment like I had. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we're, we are starting to be aware. We're actually having to educate our doctors. Um, and so obviously there's more prescriptions. You know, this time last year, there was something like 300,000 HLT prescriptions a month. And now we're looking at about 500,000 and that's gonna go up and up and up. But it's a serious issue. Women are terrified of not having their, you know, their HRT. And it, it also, it strikes me that obviously it's, it's, it's women who, who, are, who are living this and, and dealing with this, but it, it's also their, their partners, it's also, it's also men. It's yeah. in the interests of men to, to be aware of this also. Absolutely. Mo most of us, you know, Absolutely. live with someone who at some stage is going to go through this. Yeah, and we need to, men have to be part of the conversation, children have to be part of the conversation. I've got a daughter and three sons who, who know way too much about this subject now, um, but actually I'm delighted they do. But, well, you know, marriages are splitting up. I was doing an interview um, on our Facebook group this week. We did a Facebook Live with a, with a, with a family lawyer, and she said a lot of the people who are coming to her looking for divorce, she actually gently, you know, discusses with them, is it perhaps your symptoms? 
um, because it causes so many symptoms that people don't think about, and it's it's that depression. It's the psychological um, symptoms that affect you know women and and partners. My husband thought it, he you know he just didn't recognise me. I just had lost all that joy in life. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got over 25,000 women on my Facebook group. Diane Danzy Brink on her menopause support Facebook group is another 30,000. There's all these amazing Instagram accounts now. There's celebrities talking about it, MPs. So we're coming to this kind of crescendo after sort of six, seven years, which is great. But the shortage is, is a serious issue. How, how, much of a, how much of an impact has that had? Can you, can you kind of give me a context in which I could appreciate how much of a a hit women are taking and how many are being are being struck by the by the shortage well look i mean um, there's women are driving around i mean it's mainly estrogen um so you have uh, for for those that have a womb you have to have estrogen and progesterone um and and some women can have it um as a as a patch other people have it as as a gel or a spray um, and it's the estrogen which is the biggest thing that's in shortage at the moment, um, but obviously women are looking for alternatives and they're driving to four, five, six different pharmacies. You know, as you said in your intro there, they're swap, they're using, uh, one of my members is, is said to me she's just using half her dose so she can try and make it last longer. That can't, surely that's not the right thing to well, do. Well, it's not, no, because her symptoms are not being managed and it takes time to find the right sort of levels, the right doses. Um, and I don't want to scare people, anyone watching this, you know, there are one in four women who pretty much sail through menopause, and that's great, and I don't want to sort of over medicalize it. Um, and there are lots of women who've been through breast cancer, perhaps, who are on tamoxifen, who can't take HRT. Um, but for those that can and are struggling, it's, it is. It's a, it's a lifesaver. Uh, we're going to come back to this story uh, after the break. Um... But uh, at, at the moment, we're going to go to a quick uh, break and we'll come back, pick up the story and we will, I think, have another guest at that point as well. So bear with us. Start off your GB News Sunday with Stephen and Anne at breakfast from 6am. At 10, join the political correction. From 12 till 6, it's Alistair, Darren, Inaya and Nana. At 7, join Free Speech Nation for a laugh that won't be cancelled. At 9, it's Mark Dolan tonight, followed by headliners. That Sunday on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Uh, I'm still with Katie Taylor, a campaigner, 
uh, in relation to this uh, whole story of hormone replacement therapy. And I've been joined in the in the break by Janine Rusted. Now, Janine, thank you for. Uh, you had a bit of a, a hell for leather run to get in here on time, I think, didn't you? Yeah, just a bit. But <laughs> we're okay now. We're, we're all right we're now. Here. Tell me your experience of this. What's your what's your story in relation to all of this? Um, how far do you want me to go back? Well, I, I just want to I, I just want to know when it became something that you were worried about, aware of. The product, about. right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I've been fighting to get HRT for years, um, I was offered antidepressants, etc. Um, and then when I finally got it, um, the oestrogen gel and the uh, progesterone tablets, I've had it for like three months and I felt such a difference and it was really, my, my joints weren't aching anymore and I felt better in mood. As quickly as that? Yeah, just... really, yeah, honestly. Um, and then I, would, I go put my prescription in and it's run out worldwide. And I was like, well, there must be an alternative and I wasn't offered one. Um, and then when I was, it, it's not right for me. So I haven't got anything now. So have you been, have you been trying any of these? Have you been you know, making contact with people, sharing supplies? Have you, have you thought about, I believe in Spain, you can buy some of these products oh, really? over the oh, counter. Oh, I'll get onto and, that. And people are, are making all sorts of efforts to try and you know, f plug the gap for themselves. Right. I've been around all the chemists and then when I realised that was a no go, I kind of, um, I thought my only option was maybe to go private and spend more money where I couldn't get help with the NHS. Um, um, so that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. So, Katie, how familiar a story is this? That very, tells? very familiar. And it makes me so angry that women are having to pay, you know, a normal prescription charge is probably about £8 and women are paying anything up to £40, £80 to, you know, just to get the product if it's available and then to have to have, you know, go for private consultations. It's just not an affordable option. It shouldn't even be part of the discussion. Is there any indication of when these shortages will be corrected? When, when the situation will get back to... I mean, know, we've been told quality. around June, but I don't know. We've been here before in 2019. There was a shortage then as well. And, you know, I, I, I do worry. I mean, the Davina programme, the second one is coming out tomorrow night, and that is going to... I'm sure demand's going to go up even further because everyone's going to have their... People have, didn't realise what their symptoms were will probably have a light bulb moment tomorrow night. It, it sounds as though the drugs uh, uh, and the availability or the shortage of them is is just a part of of the much bigger yeah. issue. What else ought to be done? You know, you've talked about the fact that GPs, understandably perhaps, aren't particularly trained as specialists in this area. Yeah. What kind of things could be done relatively easily that would alleviate? the suffering of thousands? <laughs> well, we, we've been saying this um, for years, that something so simple, and it's not rocket science, we have on our website, we have a symptom checklist. It's a downloadable symptom checklist, and there's up to 34 symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, sometimes up to 50. And if, if women can just print that off, take it to their doctors, or the doctors, we should be given it at every um, sort of health checkup. You know, when you have a screening checkup, just say, this is perimenopause, here's a leaflet, here's a symptom checklist. Um, the other issue, is the nice guidance for menopause care, which was 2015 when it was um, introduced. Um, you know, a lot of doctors are not up to date with the fact that first line treatment is HRT and not antidepressants. Now, antidepressants, I think, are, are being given out to women. I was given them um, because they can help with things like hot flushes, but I didn't but have that, hot flushes. But that's <laughs> mad. You're not suffering from depression. People no. are not suffering from depression. So that's a, that's a misapplication of, of yeah. a drug. It's an oestrogen deficiency disease. If you had low thyroid, you'd have thyroxine. Um, you know, so if, if we were running out of thyroxine at the moment, there would be, um, you know, out, outrage. So, you know, I, I feel terribly sorry for Janine. She's suffering terribly. And the other thing is that you... Janine's a member of my Facebook group, mm -hmm. aren't you? And, yeah. yeah. Um, and you were offered um, a spray. Which yeah. alternative? Yeah, but um, when I read the... I've got um, um, a stiff liver... Um, rather than a wobbly one, so I'm. It's um, I've got to monitor that, and the um, the spray I was offered apparently isn't good for a liver, so I ha I can't take it. So I said, what else is there? Nothing. But then I spoke to a hairdresser, and she said she was on tablets, and I didn't even know they existed. I'm, f I'm fascinated by how, the, how many women are just sharing information amongst themselves yeah. rather than getting oh, yeah. any kind of backup yeah. from from medical professionals. Yeah. This is such a such an important story. I'm so glad, Janine, that you came in and that you shared your story so with I. us. And mm. 
Katie, thank, thank you. you again. Thank you. So important, I think, to bring this properly into the light and we'll probably discuss this again and, 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 and I'll hope we'll get the opportunity to do more about this and to alleviate the, the suffering of half the population of the country. So, Please, yeah. A thousand thanks to you both. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching Neil Oliver Live. Uh, I'm here until uh, eight o'clock. Uh, coming up. Here we are, here you are back with me. Coming up this hour, we meet the typing artist. Yes, there is such a thing, creating pictures with words. Uh, find out why Prince Charles is backing mask wearing for burping bovines. Yes, I did hear myself say that. And we'll meet Rosie the world's oldest pensioner penguin. You're watching GB News and I'm Neil Oliver. First the news with Tamsin Roberts. Neil, thank you. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. The MP accused of watching pornography in the Commons has announced that he will resign. Neil Parrish admitted looking at adult material on two occasions, once deliberately. A spokesperson for his local Conservative Association thanked the MP for his service and said they supported his decision. Speaking to the BBC, Mr Parrish said it was a moment of madness and that he was not proud of his actions. The uh, situation was that, that um, I, uh, funnily enough, it was tractors that I was looking at. And um, so I did get into another website um, that had a sort of very similar name. Um, and I watched it for a bit, which I shouldn't have done. But my, my crime, my biggest crime, um, is that on another occasion I went in a second time. And that was deliberately? And that was deliberate. And, and was uh, that in the Select Committee or in the Commons Chamber? That was uh, sitting, waiting, waiting to vote. Ukraine's Defence Ministry says Russia is increasing the intensity of their offensive in the east of the country. They claim that residents in the region of Kharkiv and neighbouring areas were being forcibly taken to Russia by Moscow's forces. The city of Mariupol is also still under siege, with Russian troops focusing on the steelworks, where hundreds of troops and civilians are stranded. Residents of the southern port city have spoken of the total devastation of their homes. It was my home, or what's left of it after the shellings. Everything burned, so now I have become homeless. I have nowhere to go. Now I live in my friend's place. He sheltered me for some time. Everything is gone. All that's left is the toilet, door and hallway. Nothing more. Tell me, was it a necessity to bomb civilians with such bombs? You have to be a fanatic to do it. No shame, no conscience, no feeling of proportion, nothing. They made the whole block homeless in old age. Police in Ukraine say they found a mass grave containing the bodies of men who were apparently bound, gagged and tortured. It's after the US accused the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, of brutality and depravity in his two-month invasion of the country. Kiev says more than a 1,000 bodies have been discovered in or around the town of Busha so far, where it's alleged Russia has committed numerous war crimes. Moscow rejects the allegation. The government is investigating reports an injured British man is being held captive by Russia. It's after an unverified video emerged, reportedly showing Andrew Hill being interrogated by Russian forces after being captured in Ukraine. The Foreign Office is urgently seeking more information and is supporting his family. Police searching for a woman who went missing a week ago in Lancashire say they have found a body. Katie Kenyon was last seen getting into a Ford Transit van in Burnley eight days ago. Officers say formal identification is yet to take place, but the family of the 33-year-old mother of two have been informed of the discovery. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Neil Oliver Live. Thank you for all of that. Uh, joining me once again on the couch are my panellists, Daniel and Jacob. Thanks for coming back in. Uh, Daniel, watching that excruciating footage of uh, the uh, Neil Parish MP, it's, it's not the kind of story that you expect to hear coming out of the House of Commons, is it? No, but then it's not a very... Um, it's, a, it's a fairly transient story. I think he's given new life to the expression, I was looking for tractors. 
Um, I think that's going to enter the language now, um, one way or another. But it's, um, it's both it's funny and sad and horrible at the same time. Um, I think he's probably done the right and inevitable thing in deciding to leave the House of Commons. Painful to watch, though, Jacob, yeah. is it not? Yeah, they're, they're terrible to see. And as you said, just, I mean, just kind of embarrassing more than anything else. I, I mean, and you don't want to draw, read too many political morality into it, all the rest of it. I, I do find it slightly interesting, though, that at a time we're increasingly told that um, to normalise looking at pornography or to normalise these kind of things, and we're told it's just a normal part of, no, of life and that being a sex worker is exactly the same as any other kind of job or whatever. Mm. And, the same and then people kind of realise, actually, no, there is something very different about this. You can't... Just, is, watching pornography is a, is a very different kind of thing Your to how people right. make it out. And, Deep People do react to it in a, in a quite visceral, instinctive way. You, you are quite right. Can uh, I make a quick point? Yes, uh, indeed. I think, to his credit, it was, it's painful watching it. It would have been a lot more painful if he'd been out there, as many people would have done, uh, claiming it hadn't happened. And, it, and he, to, he told the truth and yes. he fessed up. Yes. And he deserves some credit for that, actually. He does it, it could have been a lot more painful and embarrassing. He does indeed. He does indeed. Uh, moving on. Prince Charles... Uh, has backed face masks for cows in a bid to tackle climate change. The methane-catching masks could be attached to cows in an unlikely method of reducing the carbon footprint of the beef industry. Methane and carbon dioxide cows increases the threat of climate change, we're told, 95% produced by the animals through their mouths and nostrils. Uh, sounds bizarre? Joining me now is Welsh dairy farmer Steve Evans. Good evening, Steve. Uh, evening. Thanks evening. for joining me. Th there are there are stories I think I'll never read, far less have cause to talk about. But here we are, methane catching masks for cows. Can this work? The world is going mad. Um, there's a couple of things, right? If you look at the global cattle inventory for the last hundred years. It's been pretty consistent. Yes, there's been uh, rises and it's contracted. But overall, the global cattle inventory has been pretty flat all the way through. So you have to ask yourself, what is actually driving these decisions around greenhouse gases? Um, look, I, I, you know, I, I'm a dairy farmer. Um, you know, I live in Pembrokeshire, that, that, just outside a town called Haverford West. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of, of Pembrokeshire, Neil, you, you know, in, in previous programmes uh, you've done. It's a beautiful part of the world. Undoubtedly. You've got a fantastic array of, of, of industries down here. But the lifeblood of Pembrokeshire is agriculture. I've been on a farm today cutting silage for a farmer. Uh, for winter feed for his cattle, and I mentioned to him that I was I was coming on with you uh, about this, and he said, "Well, why is all the emphasis being placed upon livestock ruminants all the time? It never ends. Yet we see, as I said earlier, a flat line generally across the last hundred years of livestock inventory. Yet." The number of cars, the amount of fossil fuels being extracted, um, it's it's is is it a diversionary thing and and just i'm i'm all for new technology okay i'm all for new technology we've embraced a hell of a lot of it on the farm here in, in you know and 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 to aid us uh in terms of measuring monitoring you know there's no saying if it can be measured it can be monitored and it, it you know it just enables us to manage things better but this i i just can't get my head around it, this it's mad it, it's, it strikes me as an idea that's that's been uh, popularised by people who don't spend a lot of time around cows. Uh, if, if you watch, <laughs> if, you, if you've been, if you've spent any kind of time in yeah. the countryside and you've seen what cows do with their considerable heads and faces, <laughs> how yeah. on earth does a farmer hope to keep masks on those animals as they go about their bovine business? It's. I find it staggering. You, you know, you can see the picture of the cow there now with that mask on. There's two things in that in the, in those that cow's ears there. Those are called ear tags. We, by law, by by defra rules, have to keep ear tags in stock. Identification tags. Okay. Yet over the course of the year, 
we replace countless tags because they lose them. Uh, they knock them on a gatepost. They rub them on some fencing or in the trees, things like that. By putting this mask on, it's just something extra. And, and just in this, who's going to bear the cost of putting these masks on? And how on earth is that animal going to be able to express natural behaviour, as in graze properly? Yeah, well, exa exactly. I mean, it, it's so easy to look on this story as some kind of uh, April Fool. Uh, you know, those those images that, the, that we were looking at there. It was hard to believe that this was that this was reality that that we were talking about. But on, on a serious note, in terms of animal welfare, what's it going to be like for these poor creatures? Uh, you know, to live with these masks for, you know, across their lifetimes? What will it, what will it do to those uh, animals that, you know, in, in many ways, as you, as you say, the regulations force farmers to put so many restrictions on their natural behaviour as it is? Uh, our cow is home here. We have um, a device, it's called a moo monitor, OK? It's a collar. Uh, it's it's like a, a Fitbit, if you like. Um you know, it's a collar with a, a piece around its neck that hangs, you know, the collar hangs loose around the neck. And that monitors all the cow's functions. It, it can, it monitors its wealth and health being, uh, wealth, health and well-being. It's, um, whether it's in on heat, um, it tells me everything about that cow. It's temperature. It's basically, and I, I've got an app on my phone then, and everything comes up. So if there's a cow off colour, it comes up on my phone. This is just something that I think, well, it doesn't just stop at cows. Remember this. It doesn't just stop at, at, at an adult cow. This has got to be put in on young stock as well. So how on earth do you keep something like that on a on a calf um, that's, you know, two months old, three months old, four months old, you know, as the rumen is developing, as the cow's stomachs are developing, you know, the, the diet changes, Um you know, so they are producing methane, but I, I just, I'm, I'm just gobsmacked because this is just coming back. Methane is a cycle, okay? It's there is a cycle with methane, the same as there is with um, with CO two. It's 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 there's a carbon cycle. It's like it's the same thing, and yet you you look at fossil fuels, particularly they are being extracted from the ground. And put into the atmosphere, okay? I, I I just do not understand why on earth. Steve, bear with me while <laughs> bear with me while out. bear with me while I involve my, my, my guests here in the studio. Uh, Daniel, this is this what is this? Is this is this madness? Is this bureaucracy gone mad? Is this virtue signalling around uh, the climate crisis? What? Well, but, um, we're in the. I feel every sympathy for Steve. We're we're in the grip of a death cult, really, and its most extreme manifestations are um, mad people gluing themselves to the road and to petrol pumps, uh, wailing that the end of the world is nigh, just like they used to go around with sandwich boards in the past, saying the end of the world is nigh. And these people are nuts. Um, but it's backed up at official level by huge numbers of scientists and other people who who are demanding. Um, the most radical changes to our lifestyle. And they don't want Steve producing beef, basically. Um, they want to eradicate beef and sheep, in particular, from our diet. And fundamentally, that, that then gets tied up with the animal rights people who want us to go vegan anyway and stop eating all animals. And nobody's really being asked about this, and nobody's really assessing what contribution this makes to our long-term welfare, or if this is the solution to what they insist on calling a climate emergency, although there is no emergency uh, and the world is not about to end. Uh, uh, what they keep saying is if you don't make radical changes in two years, then at some point in the distant future the world might end. That's what their argument is. This is, you know, th these are very, very dangerous trends and they keep popping up. And what this does, this mask thing, uh, mildly ludicrous and unworkable though it is, is that it helps to normalise those those thoughts, so that you say, well, the mask doesn't work. Uh, we admit that now. It was a good idea. It doesn't work. So now we're going to have something to substitute for the mask that didn't work, and we'll Jacob, do something else. What, what, do you, what do you make of it? Do you, do you agree with Daniel that this is just a, a deliberate attempt to make the lives of, of our farmers ever more discouraging? Um, well, look, I'd agree with Daniel that there are 
lots of people in significant positions of power who would just rather we didn't eat meat or dairy or whatever and that human beings should cut back their ambitions and live less fulfilling, productive, interesting, meat-eating, tasty lives and all the rest of it. The one thing I will say, in not in defense of this scheme, which I defer to the expert in the farmers and the farms or whatever, that this isn't going to work, but there will be problems, very likely, around the climate and around flooding or around all kinds of things in the future. And I do want to just slightly push back on that. There will be technological solutions that we should embrace when they come and good technological solutions. But not masks for cows. Masks for cows is like, seems to me to be clearly ridiculous, though I defer to the farmer on, on this entirely. But generally speaking, the idea that we can have technological fixes and hacks to solve some of the effects of whatever climate change is going on, that I'd want to, I want to keep that idea and, and I would defend that idea. It's good that the, most of the methane does come out of the front of the car because if it was coming out of the back of the car, you'd have to have nappies. That's a horse of a different colour. Uh, Steve, if you're still with me, Steve Evans, farmer there, uh, you have our absolute sympathy. Uh, I, I, I know, I know it a little bit, enough to know how complicated uh, and how unwieldy are the restrictions and the complications in your life as a farmer. And my heart goes out that, that someone in their infinite wisdom has come up with masks for cows. So well, thank you for joining us and, uh, and I'll pleasure. wish you all the very best of luck. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Coming up, our Great Britain running man from Oldham uh, will be fasting while he takes on his annual 313 kilometre challenge for charity whilst fasting for Ramadan. We will be meeting Afruz Nia after the break. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, anybody old enough to remember uh, manual typewriters uh, and what a trial it often was uh, just to c compose, a, you know, compose a, a readable line of text, uh, all those stuck keys, all that tipex, it was always a challenge. Uh, well, my next guest uh, has gone way beyond that, uh, way beyond composing letters uh, or, or indeed anything else that would be read and has found an art form uh, from, his, uh, from his traditional manual typewriter. Joining me now to explain how on earth he discovered his talent. James Cook. Hello there. Great name. Thank you. Thank a, you very much. A, 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 pr a proud and honourable name there. Um, how on earth did you discover your ability to generate these astonishing works of art? Well, I, I started about eight years ago, so 2014. Um, this was just an A-level in art and just some research. I came across an artist that had done this back in the 
the 1920s. So someone else had already led the way. Yeah, and I suppose people that are familiar with typewriter art as, a, as an art form would consider him sort of the, the godfather of it, I suppose, the original creator of it. But I was inspired by his story, um, being that, you know, this was an artist, uh, basically from the age of 11, his parents gave him a typewriter because um, he had cerebral palsy, so he couldn't hold a pencil. And his parents wanted him to learn to write, so they gave him a typewriter. But what he ended up doing was making these drawings. And just, it just completely blew my mind that it was even possible. Indeed, it, it, it struck me that when, when I realised that this was even possible, I expected on seeing the images to see letters mm, uh, mm, being but, but it's mm. not what, what are it's, they, what it's are a they? combination so you've got uh, punctuation marks uh, you've got numbers there as well so you'll, you'll quite frequently see uh, if, if it's a portrait of someone it will be you know uh, a bracket symbol to, to cover the, the curvature in the pupil of someone's eye for example um, if it's an architectural subject you're using sort of underscores and capital I's for brick bonds so it's yeah now, the, the image that's on the screen at the moment, now, yes. I, I'm recognising Hollywood royalty there, am I not? <laughs> yes, you're, yes, exactly, yes, so, so Tom Hanks. So what's the, yes. what's the connection to Mr Hanks? Well, he, he actually collects typewriters, and um, he, I think he's got somewhere in the region of 120 to 140 typewriters. He's okay. collected them all, all of his life. Um, I, it was going to happen at some point that I was going to do and, a picture. And we actually, actually um, got that, actually got yes. that image here. There actually, go. actually got uh, Mr. Tom Hanks there. You've been in, you've been in contact with with Tom Hanks on account of your peculiar ability. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I did a, I did a program in America um, at the Kelly Clarkson show, and the producers had said, "Oh, if only we'd have known at the time that he collected typewriters." It was only until, until I told them, mm -hmm. and um, they said, "Oh, we would have rescheduled it." So what I ended up doing was contacting his production company and sent a print and completely forgot about it and eight months go by and suddenly this letter arrives in the post with Playtone Productions which is Tom Hanks production company and I thought mm -hmm. ah I know what that is. If, um, if, you, if you cast so. your mind back to the beginning of all this what was the first uh, creation that you produced from a typewriter? My, my, the first creation I think and again because my I suppose my interest is, is in architecture so uh, it would have been a building I think it was the Woolworth building in New York um, thinking to myself well that has lots of straight lines and typewriters like to move from left to right. So I thought that would be an easy place to start, but... And how yeah. long did it take you to, to compose that, that work? That was, I think it was about four days of work. It was incredibly challenging and it still is to this day. It, it never gets any easier. Now, um, <laughs> on, on here, I mean, I'm looking here, so here's, a, here's an image of, uh, of, of her Madge. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the, I cannot get over the fact that this is composed of characters that appear on a, on a manual typewriter keyboard. Have you ever counted up how, how many, have you ever uh, considered how many uh, characters are actually used? Well, I know in a, a, a more recent picture that I did, so this is the thing, so these are just A4 in size, but um, I do like to challenge myself and do drawings that are larger than the carriage of the typewriter. So the biggest picture I have done is about four foot by five foot. And I know that I, I did actually count and there was about 100,000 individually stamped marks, but there's probably about 10,000 marks in an A4 picture. 10,000 on Her yeah. Majesty there. On Her Majesty, yeah. And also there's, there's messages concealed in that picture, so it says Queen. That's the thing, there's something nice about being able to create a piece of art where from a distance, it's quite obviously a picture of someone, and you may not even recognise it as something that has been typewritten from a distance. It's only when you get really close to the picture that you actually spot oh, there's letters, numbers and punctuation marks that have made this picture. And then you look even closer and you spot yeah. these, these words. So it's nice to have the, this kind of, this sort of it, two layers of information. To, amazing. To, to I write. mean, no matter how close the camera gets, you still, you still, can, you still cannot, you <laughs> you still need a cannot take, in the, take in the characters. Now, you're getting commissions now, I believe, mm. from around the world. Yes, it's amazing how people find out. And again, the same with, so it's, what's really nice is people always challenge me with, with a really interesting project. And sometimes they might not just come to me with an idea, but they'll have a typewriter in mind. Really? And they'll be prepared to post it. So, I've, so the what? red typewriters come from Florida. Why, why, um, why, would it, why would it matter to someone what, what typewriter was used in the, in the creation? Well, so some of the keyboards have different languages. So I've got one that has a Hebrew script. There's, there's one with Arabic script. Um, 
and some people specify that they want a, a typewritten drawing that is in a different language. And um, that obviously adds another layer of complexity to creating the work. And I, th I think I read somewhere that one of the works that you were asked uh, to, to undertake mm. involved uh, fragments of a wedding day speech, is yes. that right? Tell me that one. Yes, so that was for a, uh, a fashion designer based in China and um, this, uh, he was, uh, unfortunately his, his mother had passed away recently and they were clearing out the contents of, of her house and her possessions and they opened up one of these, one of her cabinets and found the wedding speech that she had read to him on his wedding day and so he wanted a picture that was not just his mother but when you looked really closely you could see these uh, components written in so the, so the so weave of her jumper so it was it was it was a nice combination um, uh, and, and actually ever since I've, I've done that piece of work I will always hide messages in, in the drawings now because people almost sort of expect to find words. Well it seems, so, yeah. it seems almost irresistible given that you're yeah. using a, a piece of equipment that is for the written word. Exactly. Yeah. Almost irresistible to, 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 to put in little yeah. oh, offerings. Definitely. Yeah. What's been your favourite of all your creations so far? Or is that an impossible question? Oh, it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I, I suppose my, because my background is in architecture, anything that is building related. Um, see, I, I have a studio based in London as well, so I'm lucky to be in the centre of, you know, some pretty amazing landmarks. And I recently did a project that was uh, the 45th floor of um, a skyscraper in the sort of the Canary Wharf complex. And you can see, I think, for about as far as the horizon is 28 miles or something on a clear day. And so that was a particularly challenging drawing because you, you don't just see what's immediately in front of you, but you can see the horizon. And so there's a, a kind of progression in, in, or a deter deterioration in, in resolution. And suddenly you, you've got buildings on the very edge of the horizon, and they may only be represented as just a, a capital I or a you know a capital H, something very basic. But then immediately in front of you, you've got buildings that are super detailed and complex. Um, you mentioned that you were inspired to do this by a, 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 a pioneer who, mm. who went before you. Uh, in doing this, and, and your work being circulated more widely, are you, are you aware of anybody else that's doing, that's it's, undertaking similar work? It's, it's interesting. We've, there's, there's a very small niche Facebook group. Um, I think there's about five of us on there, and we're based all around. So, so there's someone in Colombia who, who does this as well, and she combines um, her, her DJ sets and does typewriter art at the same time. Um, and I think there's someone else in Germany. But again, it's, it's interesting in the same way that you can associate different paintings with different artists. Everyone approaches this in their own style. Yeah. That's what's nice about it. Now this one here, for example, it's a, it's a, it's a, a landscape or a, or a townscape. Where are we? Uh, I believe that one is, let's just have a quick look. Which one this is one that? This one here. That is, oh yeah, so that's Finchingfield in Essex. So again, I, I've, even though I've, I've got a studio in London, um, I live in Essex. Okay. Um, this is just down the road from me. Um, but yeah, it's a very picturesque part of uh, North Essex. And um, yeah, it's, uh, th that was a picture that I did back in, when was that? July last year. Um, and then this one here, you've, so the, 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 you, do you tend to work in, in, in black and white or mono, this monochrome? This is the thing, so um, the, the two most common colours that you can get on a, a conventional typewriter ribbon are black and red. So um, when there's an opportunity to, to uh, you know, the type of drawing that has, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the dominant colour is red, then, um, yeah, the Root Master bus is great for that. Um, Talk me through the process. Is it, in, is it in any way in the way that you would structure a letter? Do you start at the, do you start oh, at the top and work line be, by would, line? It would be really challenging to, no, because again, most people think that you start from the top and you go layer by, uh, line by line. But um, no, it's, this is the thing. So you can, with, with most of the typewriters, you can, um, this is the thing. So this is a, I, I, the way that I describe this to people is try and name another way of drawing that requires both hands because when you use a pencil, you normally just use one, one hand or a paintbrush. So you're using your left hand to twist the line spacer. So mm -hmm. that's your up and down. Mm -hmm. And then your left and right is, will ordinarily move to the next every time you, you press a key. Uh, and you're trying to hold that back to type the in-between. So you're, you're kind of working all over the page. But generally, to, to begin, you will start by trying to type an outline so you have a point of reference to, to work with. Otherwise, you're, you know, 
it, it can be incredibly intimidating to work from a blank piece of paper from the beginning. So the hardest, particularly with, I mean, uh, typing a portrait, trying to get facial features that are so precisely accurate, you know. So I, I will always start with typing the eyes. Um, that's it's one of the hardest facial features to to get, you know, to get right. And this this I, I keep on I keep on coming back to this one. I think this one is just particularly. This one's just particularly clever, I would say. How long, how long to, to create Tom Hanks? I think Tom Hanks was, I Look think, a, it's normally about four to five days, but when I say that, that's four to five long days of, of typing. And, you know, I think with, with some of the drawings, when it's, when it's possible to work outside, this is a thing. So these sort of typewriters, they have their own carry cases and they're portable. So I like to work outside a lot. So I'll take a, a fold out chair with me and and go wherever oh, so, possible. So people might come across you actually Oh yeah, absolutely. At work. Yeah, I've had people sort of like tap me on the shoulder and be like, ah, oh, I've, I've seen that. How, uh, is, this, so. is, this now your, <laughs> is this now your main occupation? This, and, yeah, this is my full-time job. So this is, this, I've, since uh, June last year, I've been doing this full-time. And how do you, uh, you know, in the pub, someone, how, how do you describe your occupation? Oh, it's, it's always tricky. Because I think at first people think, oh, so you make sculptures from typewriters, you upcycle them, you take them apart. And I say, no, I'm actually using them to, to make drawings. Um, I think it's because it's such a visual job or it, you just have to show people pictures. It's, it's, it's really tricky to put into words. Absolutely. Um, it's just wonderful. I, I'm, I'm, I'm endlessly impressed. I could, I could pour over these for hours. James Cook, that's, thank what you a journey much. of discovery you've set thank out you. upon, like, you your, uh, like your noble predecessor. Thanks so much for coming in with that. Wonderful stuff, quite captivating. And so unusual, uh, something I never thought I'd see, pictures made of, 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 of typewritten characters, wonderful. Now, as if running 313 kilometres wasn't a daunting enough prospect, Afruz Mia from Oldham is set to undertake the challenge while fasting for the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Uh, so it'll be without sustenance that Afruz will run through 23 cities in 23 days to raise money for and to raise awareness of those living harder lives here at home and around the world. Afros is my Great Britain this week and he joins me now. Good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening, how are you? I'm very well, uh, but more importantly, how are you? Have you embarked on this arduous journey yet? Uh, we completed this journey yesterday, actually. Um, we, um, it was the second time round I've done this. Last year I did straight Oldham to London, 313 kilometers and this year I did 23 different cities and we ended the campaign last night uh, in uh, London. Did you come up with such a, 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 you know, an astonishingly challenging uh, physical effort and, and, and furthermore, why did you uh, decide to do it during the holy month? Uh, Holy month of Ramadan is about giving, giving back and it's about sacrifice um, and I thought this is my way of going through you know the pains and struggles uh, which is only short term uh, people who I'm supporting around the globe you know um, they, they've got it long term so at least I can come back to a warm house uh, come back to a in a hot shower you know warm food but uh, people who I'm trying to support don't have that luxury so my 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 struggle is short term where the people uh, around the world have uh, who I'm supporting have a, a long term struggle why 313 kilometers how, how did you how did you arrive at the distance 313 is i mean um, is is linked to the islamic uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the uh, sahabas uh, the companions of the prophet they were 313 and um, uh, and the distance from Oldham to London, which I <laughs> started through Google, was 313 kilometres going through the countryside. So that's that, that's how I came up with the 313. Now you, you've done this before. Um, as the years as the years progress, I, I can only imagine it's getting tougher to contemplate this challenge every year. It's getting tougher, but uh, I'm getting more uh, people joining in, different people from different towns and cities doing their own 313. So uh, initially I was the only one who did it. This year, I think four or five people did 313 in different towns and cities. People did what they could, and hopefully next year there'll be more people, you know, jumping on the bandwagon as well, inshallah. 
How, how, much, uh, how much money have you been able to raise by your efforts? This campaign so far this year we've raised £100,000. Uh, last year we raised £130,000. Uh, Goodness me, and where will that money go? Who benefits from your... This, this money will go to support about... the uh, orphans, the widows, the elderly, the people affected by wars in, uh, in, in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Kashmir, Lebanon, Syria, Gaza. We also work closely with uh, local charities like Maggie's Cancer Care in Oldham, uh, worked with um, children with heart conditions in Bolton, uh, and also homeless homeless uh, and people who are sleeping rough in the, you know, uh, around Manchester and UK. Tell me what it's like to, uh, to put yourself through this kind of physical effort without eating and drinking. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, somehow I think it's a spiritual thing because it's Ramadan, it's a month of giving, and I feel uh, the, I can do more in Ramadan than I normally do. So it's one of them things. and. Uh, I definitely, definitely think is 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 the spiritual side and, and and the community coming together. When you see these donations coming in, people donating, you know, three hundred thirteen pound and so on and so forth, uh, that gives me the ammunition and the uh, you know the resilience to keep going. So, do you find it as a, a a spiritually enriching experience as well as a physically draining one? Definitely, definitely. Am I, right in, am I right in thinking, and obviously, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I understand that uh, technically, because you are undertaking an arduous journey, you, you would in fact be uh, allowed, if you wished, to eat and drink while taking on this challenge. Yes, you would be. Um, uh, as a, as a traveller, if you are travelling a distance more than 47 kilometres, you are classed as a traveller. So hence, that then you don't have to be fasting or but you have to make that up. But the reason I'm doing it in Ramadan is is to go through the struggles and, uh, you know, otherwise I could do this, you know, in winter or in some, any other time I wanted to. Yeah, so Ramadan is really the whole point of it. Afriz, bear with me, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to my guests as, as well, but, but, but stay there. It's quite something, isn't it? 313 kilometres without a drop of water. Well, it's I mean, it's, a, it's tremendously inspiring, and it makes it brings home to one how small one is really, and how little you know I do, and how little most people do um, to help raise money for others, and it's just terribly inspiring. And uh, congratulations to him. Jacob, are you a, are you a runner? Are you a marathon man? Uh, no, I gave up running a little while ago. I do some other things, but nowhere near in the kind of endurance uh, capacity that Afros is doing. And as, as Daniel says, it's, it's hugely inspiring. It's also very kind of uh, inspiring and refreshing to hear someone talk about how it's a, it has a kind of spiritual component as well and how his faith like, plays a part in this. And that's, a, that's part of the, rarely part of the public conversation, really, people's faith. And I, I find that interesting and inspiring. Yeah. Afras, every every week, I don't know if you know, but we, we try and we try and turn a spotlight on people who are, you know, who are, who are giving something, you giving something back, giving of themselves, giving of of, of their time. It's it's quite often uh, the people who are overcoming some kind of uh, physical or emotional challenge or a, or an injury. Um, but I, I have to say, in in every case, and and yours is no exception, there's something infinitely uplifting about just hearing from someone who's putting themselves through a challenge for the sake of reaching out to others and turning a light uh, on those whose lives are so much harder than our own. Um, and so I can, I can begin to touch the outside edge of what it is that inspires you to, to do this. And as Jacob said, the fact that there is that spiritual component to, to what you're doing, it, it, it must say something to the people among whom you arrive and, and the communities that you touch. It must say so much more. And, and that is why I've had a phenomenal kind of uh, overwhelming support in the cities visited. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I mean, the, I, I actually started this three years ago and the initial reason was due to, due, due to my ill health. I was 16 and a half stones. I had cataract in my left eye. Uh, and when I went for my operation, I was the I was I was forty six at that time, and everybody in that room were more than eighty plus, and hence I wasn't sure why I you know the reason. So I went back to my GP and found out it's because I had high blood pressure, high hypertension. 
So he, he said either you change your lifestyle, you change your uh, habits, or you're on medication for life. Uh, and I chose the, I chose the uh, you know uh, the the uh, latter one. Surely, surely though, surely though, there must be days when you get into the run where you're waking up in the morning and think, <laughs> not today, not today. No, uh, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, uh, you wake up, you know, with aches and pains, and you know, but like I said, I mean, you know, when I wake up, like I will check my, you know, uh, uh, donation page, and I see donations coming in, and people, you know, inspiring you by, you know, giving beautiful messages and uh, message of encouragement, and then that keeps keeps you going. And and when I visit different towns and cities, when people join in with me, so it's like a kind of a a, a, a rally. A, a, a relay kind of thing. So I'm meeting different people, talking about different things when we're running, and 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 that that is like every day is different. It's not the same. Afros Mia, uh, you are without a shadow of a doubt uh, amongst the uh, the fine company of the Great Britons of GB News. Thank you for your time and uh, whatever you. whatever epic challenge you set yourself next. I wish you all the very best of luck. And I think that goes from all of us here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Jacob, are you inspired to change your lifestyle, make a commitment to better the community around you, having listened to Afros' work? Well, I, I can certainly get behind the, the bettering the community part. Um, and, I mean, I've seen lots of that in the UK generally, say, with the refugee issue and the help that people have shown to, say, U Ukrainian refugees. Personally speaking, I mean, no, I'm, I mean, after we're here in the studio, I'm going to go out and have a couple of beers and eat some food. But, but, but on the community level, fully behind those kinds of efforts. And sure, maybe over the weekend, rather than staying I in admire, bed, I should get up. I admire your honesty. Daniel, do, do we need to hear more of these stories? I find every week when I, when I make contact with someone like Afros, it, it makes me feel better about the uh, state of the nation. Yeah, no, I think there's a tremendous amount of um, work going on, selfless work going on out in the community that isn't sufficiently exposed on the television because people like talking about Partygate and things like that. And, and it's good, it's really great that you're uh, you know, bringing these stories out and letting people see them. So I think, yes, we do need more. Because otherwise there tends to be, and I know I'm as guilty of it as the next uh, person, of, of focusing on the dark and focusing on the downside. Yeah. And I think there's a genuine need out there for people to be uplifted by yeah, being reminded mo most people, of the goodness. Most people do lead positive and happy lives and they have um, the, the benefits and support of family life and, and, and many of them have decent work they enjoy, uh, many people have decent work they enjoy and so on. And actually people aren't living lives of, of, of terrible misery all the time. Some sadly are, but most people aren't. But, and that's why I think they stop watching the news, because they get so much misery shoveled at them and they stop buying newspapers. So a little bit of positive, I think, is, um, is great. Well done. What about the, uh, the, the Academy of Ideas? What, d does that chime at all with that, that, that um, push towards positivity and empowering people that you mentioned at the top of the programme? Do, do we need to pay more attention to what we can achieve as individuals, as communities? Well, yeah, I mean, like, uh, well, first of all, I mean, what the work we do at the Academy of Ideas, we put on public events and debates and discussions, and we'll be having the Battle of Ideas as we do uh, every year, which is a big public event, so you can sort of Google that and find find out information about that. But that's, I mean, that's about tackling some of the big issues that we face as society. It's not all going to be good news, and it can't all be, but we do at least hope to think that by bringing people together in public, having a conversation, hearing a variety of different perspectives and not shying away from either the good things or the bad things, but by bringing people together and having those conversations, maybe you can uh, get a better grip on some of the challenges that face us in society. I think we, I think we need to find inspiration somewhere. I think, you know, you know as, we, as we discussed earlier in the programme, you know, the, 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 the unhappy events unfolding around the House of Commons recently, there's not much inspiration to be had in, in the behaviour we're seeing there. But we need to see the positive behaviour of people and community somewhere, do we not? 
Yeah, and I mean, well, the Academy of Ideas, we're big into history and historical events, and you can find lots of inspiration from historical events. In the contemporary world, we can find, I personally find lots of inspiration in uh, the heroism that's shown by people fighting in, in, in for Ukraine and for their sovereign territory there. Um, and, but generally, I mean, every now and again, we hear some act of heroism happening in the news, and there's a half a conversation about whether we need some kind of better recognition on this publicly, and somebody suggests we invent a new medal, and, and then there's stories that you hear where somebody was awarded some medal and they never got it. And I think there would be a bit of a space in our society for really putting some effort behind some kind of citizen or civic um, recognition scheme that had like serious backing and that, that people took seriously and we could find a way as a society of celebrating ordinary acts of heroism. Do we pay enough attention to ordinary acts of heroism, Daniel? Is there enough? No, well, as I was saying, I don't think, I don't think we do. Um, but at the same time, you have to say that what Alfred is doing is not ordinary. I mean, this is an extraordinary action. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't expect a lot of people to be going out and doing uh, what he's doing because it is physically very, very arduous. And, um, and uh, there are lots of other, uh, one hopes, there are lots of other less arduous ways in which people can make a voluntary contribution, and many people do. And often it's not even in an organised way, it's just the way in which they help neighbours and look, after, look out for people and so on, look out for the elderly person living, you know, at the end of the road um, and things like that. I think what it does, you're quite right, most of us could not contemplate running 313 no. kilometres or through 23 cities in 23 days, that's no. extreme. But if listening to it inspires somebody to go out for a walk, you know, just to, to undertake something because the, the simplest changes to your life can make the change that makes all the difference. Yes. And it, you know, I've got, a, you know, I've got a, a retired nurse friend who said if she could bottle the benefits of going for a walk for 20 minutes every day, then she would, and she would prescribe it freely. You know, that if people watch Afros and, and, and hear about his endeavours and then think, I can go out, I can make small changes in my life, and that ripples out into the, yeah. into the family and into the wider community. Moving on, uh, still to come on Neil Oliver Live, believe it or believe it not, the world's oldest humble penguin, Rosie, God lover, has celebrated her 32nd birthday with a cake made of uh, watermelon and fish and we will be talking to the head keeper who looks after Rosie after this break. On Mark Dolan tonight, do the left have a problem with free speech? We'll debate that with ex-Labour MP George Galloway and former Labour London Mayor Ken Livingston. My Mark Meets guest is a reality star and actress who appeared in Elf, Law & Order, Gossip Girl and The Good Wife, Marissa Jade. In the news agenda with my panel, is Lord Frost right that the state is now too big? And in my big opinion, we've got to end the hysteria around climate change. See you at nine. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. 
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. A game old bird celebrated her birthday recently with a cake made of fish and watermelon. Not everyone's cup of tea perhaps, but the old bird in question was Rosie, the humble penguin. At 32, the oldest of her kind in captivity anywhere in the world, although my guest Daniel will be seeking to dispute the, uh, the, the claim to fame of, of Rosie, the world's oldest penguin. Rosie lives at Sowerby Zoo in East Yorkshire and she shared the celebrations with her children, Twinnie, Webster and Flip Flop, and also her grandchild, Pickle. You heard it here first. Among those singing happy birthday to Rosie was headkeeper John Pickering, and he's with me now. Hello, John. Hello, Neil. Nice Hello. To meet How, you. Pleased to meet you too. How special is Rosie? She she must be she must be as old as must be older than you. <laughs> Not quite. I'm sixty. Um, no, it's very special. The lifespan in the wild would be fifteen to twenty. So uh, they do get older in captivity. We've had them get to 24 and 25. But for Rosie to get to 32, it's quite remarkable, really. And where do Humboldt penguins uh, live in the wild? What's their natural habitat? They come from the west coast of South America, from Chile to Peru. Uh, they live on the coastline um, of Chile and Peru. Uh, yeah, that's where they're from. They're named after the Humboldt Current, which is the cold current of water that they swim in. How is the how is the wild species doing? Um, there's just over twenty three thousand left in the wild, and it's decreasing. Uh, the breeding colonies are, are going down. They've been monitoring them, and they are decreasing. So th there's a number of threats to them. They are classed as vulnerable to extinction in the wild. Uh, one of the main threats is overfishing of anchovies, which is their preferred prey species. Will offspring? I, I name checked Rosie's. Uh... Uh, Rosie's uh, offspring, w will they and others like them play a role in, in helping the wild species? Are there, are there uh, breeding programmes to help boost the, the humble population? Yes, there's a European endangered breeding programme. And so Rosie has had three uh, offspring and we recently had a granddaughter of her uh, last year, one of her daughters. Um, hatched, well, she didn't hatch the egg last year, it ended up hatching in an incubator and I read it at home. And that's Pickle, who you mentioned. And will, so, so there, is a, there is a worldwide programme to, to reintroduce captive offspring into the wild population, is that right? I'm not sure about the reintroduction, but there's certainly a European endangered breeding programme and we have, we have uh, raised funds to help penguins in Peru. There's, um, there's a, you know, a, a conservation society out in, in Peru helping them in the wild with things like sustainable guano harvest. So because they do nest in guano, but it's excavated for fertiliser. And so they are doing a sustainable guano harvest, you know, so that they're not taking away the nesting sites. And what does Rosie like to do now in these, her twilight years? She spends most of her time with her daughter, Flip Flop, who she had when she was 20, uh, which is quite elderly to still be breeding at the age of 20. Um, she, shares one, uh, she shares one of the caves uh, with her and uh, spends most of the day with her. She loves to eat still. She does have a bit of arthritis, so we do give her pain relief in the first fish we give her. Um, but she's very, very good at swimming still, and she's still got a great appetite, but she, she does spend a lot more time sleeping now. But, but they're, 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 they're sociable, though, and, and recognise family. I'm, I'm surprised that, from the sounds of it, she, she likes to spend time with Ken. Yes, she does, yeah. I mean, like I say, she spends a lot of time with Flip Flop. I mean, the others spend time with her, you know, Webster and... and um, Twinny, and um, like you said, she's got a granddaughter now in Pickle, and um, but Pickle sort of tends to follow me about because she was hand reared. And did Rosie and the rest enjoy their cake of watermelon and fish? 
she enjoyed the fish the watermelon was just for display um to put the fish in but she enjoyed that and we all sang happy birthday to her and yes uh, i think she really enjoyed it splendid splendid stuff um i'm always delighted to hear i'm al always cheered by news of uh, some of these uh, animal characters that we have among us and it's it's lovely to see a little bit of light uh, turned upon rosie the humboldt penguin john pickering uh, from uh, from the zoo there. Thank you very much for your time and uh, wish us all the very best uh, to Rosie from all of us here. Thank you very much. Will do. Thank you very much. So, come on, Daniel, what was your issue with um Well, I just feel, you know, I, I'm, first of all, I'm thrilled for Rosie. Absolutely delighted. Let's make that clear. Um, and she'll be in the Guinness Book of Records now. But we only know about her because she's in captivity. And as John said, there are 23,000, 25,000 of these birds out there. And all I'm saying is there could be a few out there who are older than Rosie. And the unfairness of life is that they will never get into the Guinness Book of Records and their families will have that resentment with them for a very long time to come. Indeed. So I just want to remember that. You know, the, the, there are people potentially out there who do cap Rosie and we shouldn't be forgetting those on this important day. Jacob, it's... Always worrying, though, is it not, to hear a number like 23,000 associated to a species in the wild. We, we cover so many stories on here mm. about big cats. Uh, we had uh, a lowland gorilla, uh, name-checked as the oldest gorilla in captivity in Britain recently. That constant drip-drip story of, of numbers of these species falling in the wild is a, is a great sadness. Uh, yeah, it is, it's sad to see numbers go down, not least in, in this case, because I think, it, as it illustrated by this penguin and the story, the family stories, I mean, birds can tell us a lot about, um, strangely, they can tell us a lot about what it means to be human. If I'll, I'll give a plug, I've, an old friend of mine has just written a book called The Parrot in the Mirror. You should get him on, but it's talking about how, actually, because birds face very similar evolutionary pressures to humans, that actually they share a lot of characteristics. And that's why birds, in this case, live a lot longer. They tend to have closer family relationships than even the mammals that would be, say, closer to us, uh, evolutionarily speaking. So you, you should get the author of that book on, because it's, it's a really interesting book. And, but on the conservation question, yes, that is, is, is sad when numbers of uh, species decline. I mean, hearing about anchovies, I love anchovies, so maybe I should think twice. Um, but generally speaking, of course, we have to weigh these things up. Every, every step taken to... Uh, maintain a habitat in, say, South America probably means less jobs for anchovy farmers in in South America too. So I, I think we have to weigh these things up. And it's sad when animal populations decline, but my priority um, will always be will always be with humans. Daniel, to turn to matters more serious, when, when you look when you look on when you look on at what's unfolding at the moment, cost of living crisis, and all its all the attendant problems shortages of energy, rising prices, interest rates, inflation and the rest. Do you see any light? Do you see any cause for optimism? Do you see ways up to the to the sunlit uplands again? I, I'm, I'm the most optimistic person you'll ever come across. I mean... Based on what? Based on optimism. I mean, you know, we have a huge history of solving problems. We're very good at solving problems. Um, and, and very often it's private enterprise that solves our problems for us. And governments sometimes are getting in the way rather than actually helping. But we're hugely capable of, so we're problem solving species. And, and there's no reason to think we're not going to solve some of these problems as well. We will, we master them. We know the techniques, we know what you have to do I'll to trust inflation. You. Under I'll trust you, I'll trust you. That's all from me and Neil Oliver Live. Thanks as always to my panel, Daniel Moylan, Jacob Reynolds, and to all of my guests tonight. Next up, it's Mark Dolan tonight, and I will see you next week. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners.